We're going to talk about the heart. We're going to dissect a pig heart for you, and uh, you can ask me questions if you have any, and I'll answer them the best I can. So you guys have been dealing with the heart now. I suppose this is your second day. So you should be experts, I guess, right? After two days. So I'm going to give you a general overview of the heart. I'm going to talk about things in kind of general terms, but I will also you know, throw in some scientific lingo there because you guys are scientific students who are volunteering for such a cool opportunity. All right, so the heart is basically a series of collecting chambers and pumping chambers. The heart is going to be beating throughout your entire life. Can anybody guess how many times the heart will beat in the average person's life? Feel free to unmute yourself, guys, if you want to try and chime in and answer a question that Dr. Cossett asked. Is it like Price is Right? If we go over, do we lose? No, there are no prizes either. <laughs> okay, well, if we don't, if, if we, uh, we're not gotten off for going over, I'm going to say more than three. <laughs> more than three times, yep. I think it, mine's beaten more than three times so far since talking to you. All right. So that's the lower limit, three. How many times do you think it beats in the average person's life? Okay, I'll answer it for you then. So if the heart is beating 70 or 80 times a minute and you're living for something like 70 or 80 years, you can expect the heart to beat more than 2 billion times during a lifetime. That is amazing considering that each one of those beats have to happen essentially perfectly for the heart to function normally and to pump, body, pump blood throughout the entire body. So the heart is a really amazing <clears throat> organ capable of many, many beats throughout the life and capable of sustaining people during their entire lifetime. So you guys were provided with heart models, right? So you should have heart models at home. The heart models are gonna be numbered. The heart models have uh, sheets associated with them. They have all the answers on it. As we dissect the heart, I will compare it to the human heart. And uh, you guys basically have the answers right here in front of you. You should be able to follow along, no problem. So the heart sits in the chest, right, in the thorax. It's covered by ribs. It's going to be in between the lungs. It's not exactly in the middle of the body. It's slightly displaced to the left. The heart's going to be covered with a sac. And one of these hearts here has a little bit of that sac still adhering to it. So this part right here. So your heart is actually going to be completely enclosed in a sac. And this sac which we have a little bit of the remnants right here, is called the pericardium. The heart sits in that pericardium, and within the pericardium, you got something called pericardial fluid. And you can think of pericardial fluid basically as like uh, motor oil or something like that, okay? So the heart is bathed in that pericardial fluid, and it's lubricated by that pericardial fluid, and it allows it to expand and contract inside of the chest throughout your entire lifetime. And it's just a really, really low friction environment in that pericardial sac with the pericardial fluid. So these hearts, they are not human hearts. And that's okay. These are pig hearts. The thing about pigs is their anatomy is very, very similar to a human. If you dissect a pig, you'll notice that their organs share very similar proportions to a human. They're basically in all the same spots. If you look at something like the teeth and the jaw muscles from a pig, they look almost exactly like ours. So pigs share a similar evolutionary history with humans, and we also have very similar lifestyles. We're both omnivores. We eat plant matter and we eat meat. So using a pig heart in place for a human heart really works because of similar evolutionary histories and similar lifestyles. So I'm gonna dissect this heart for you guys right now. Hopefully nobody's too squeamish. Actually, before I dissect it, why don't we just talk about the surface anatomy before I wreck it for you, okay? So the heart is going to sit inside the chest, kind of like this, okay? You'll have a number of surfaces on the heart. You'll have an inferior surface right here, also called the diaphragmatic surface. 
that's going to touch your diaphragm, which is a really big muscle that is at the bottom of the thorax, and it's used for breathing. So this part of the heart is going to touch the diaphragm, which is a big breathing muscle. This upper surface here, the superior surface, this is going to be the surface that's toward your head. And you're going to have a lot of really big vessels coming out of there. So you'll have big vessels coming out of the superior surface of the heart, heading toward the head. And then you'll have two surfaces that touch the lungs. So on either side of the heart, both right and left, you will have parts of the heart that are going to be up against the lungs. If we look at the outside of the heart, we have two big flaps right here that basically look like ears. These things are called the oracles. And that, that's Latin, I believe, for ear. So the early anatomists were not very creative. They basically looked at something and they go, yeah, that looks like an ear. And then they called it the oracle. So nice and easy. The surface of the heart is going to be covered in kind of a membranous surface. And that's part of the pericardium, that sac that we talked about earlier. So you're going to have what is referred to as a visceral layer of the serous pericardium. The name's not necessarily important, but it overlaps onto the heart and it's going to cover the outside of the heart. And that's called the epicardium. So there's three different layers of the heart. You got your epicardium, which is going to be the outermost part. You got the myocardium, which is the thick, meaty, muscular part. And then you're going to have the inner surface of the heart called the endocardium. We'll see that a little bit more later. So there's basically three different layers of the heart. Nice and easy to remember those things. Nice and easy uh, arrangement of the heart there. Another thing you're going to notice about the heart is it's got lots of blood vessels on the surface. So I just said a second ago that the heart has lots of muscles in it, right? The heart's basically like a great big muscle. And we know that muscles, they need blood going in and out of them. So you've got lots of arteries and veins on the surface of the heart, providing the muscles of the heart with blood. The veins, they're called cardiac veins. The arteries, called coronary arteries. You could think of the veins as being responsible for collecting all of the used blood. So all the blood that's gone through the heart, supplying the muscles of the heart, it becomes deoxygenated. It needs to be sent back to the lungs eventually to get more oxygen in them. So those cardiac veins, they collect the blood and most of them are going to go to the back of the heart into something called the coronary sinus. So you got this gigantic collecting chamber in the back of the heart. Let's see if I can find it for you. So I'm gonna stick my probe through it right now. It's right back here on the back side of the heart, right there. That's where a majority of those cardiac veins are going to be dumping into. And then itself, it dumps back into the heart and then the whole process starts all over again where the blood gets oxygenated and sent back to the heart. The arteries on the surface of the heart, coronary arteries, they're all gonna be branching off of something called the aorta, which is this big, thick walled vessel right here. So it's obvious that you got veins and arteries on the surface of the heart. And that makes sense because the heart is basically a great big muscular structure. It needs a lot of blood flow to it in order to function properly. Okay, what else do I have to tell you about the surface? That'll probably do it. Why don't we get our dissection started? So if anybody's squeamish, I'm sorry ahead of time. So I'm going to be using a scalpel to do this dissection. It's basically the same way that we would have students do it in their first year of medical school. Unfortunately, this year, because of COVID, we can't have you guys in here doing the dissection yourself. So I'm going to be doing it for you. Some of you are probably bummed out that you can't do it, while others are probably 
quite excited that they don't have to do this. But, so the first part that I'm going to dissect is going to be this structure right here. It's on the right side of the heart, and it's going to receive the blood from the body. So you got two different great big vessels that are gonna flow into that structure. Let's see if I can poke my finger through and find where they go. Here we go. So we've got one that is superior. So this is on the right side, guys. Can you compare it to your heart model? On the right side, it's going to be the superior vessel going into this big chamber right here. Let me point it out on the heart model. It's right there, this big blue thing. Does anybody know what that's called on your heart model? Big blue thing. Number three. Go. Uh, well, Alex, excuse me? Go Alex, go ahead. You raise your hand. And then Maggie? The superior vena cava? Yeah, the superior vena cava. Does anybody know what the superior vena cava does? Go ahead, Kai. Um, it brings the blood into the heart. Exactly. So it's going to gather all the blood generally from the upper body, and it's going to deliver it into the right atrium, which is like a great big collecting chamber. It collects all the blood from the upper and lower body. So we've got two different uh, vena cavae. We've got the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. And they're both dumping into the right atrium. So superior vena cava, see if I can run a probe through there. Oh, I can't, bummer. The superior vena cava is going to dump into the right atrium, which is a great big collecting chamber. And then the inferior vena cava will also dump into the right atrium. The inferior, so if the superior vena cava is gathering blood from the upper body, what do you think the inferior vena cava is gathering blood from? Yeah, I see some people pointing down. Yeah, the um, lower body. Maggie. Maggie, go ahead. What, what's your answer? The lower part of the body. Exactly. So the superior vena cava is gathering blood from the upper body. The inferior vena cava is gathering blood from the lower body. Superior vena cava doesn't have a valve associated with it. So there is no valve up here where the superior vena cava dumps into the right atrium. But there is a valve associated with the inferior vena cava. Can somebody hypothesize? Can somebody give me a good scientific guess why we would need a valve on the inferior vena cava but not the superior vena cava? Liam, go ahead. I saw your hand first, Liam. You'd, you'd need one on the inferior because the blood's going up, whereas on the other one it's going down, so gravity naturally makes it come down. 100% gravity, exactly. So. Basically, the effect of gravity is going to want to push blood back into the lower body, but, you know, we don't want that to be pooling in the lower body. We want to force it back up into the heart, and we want to keep it circulating through the body. So because of that, your inferior vena cava is going to have a valve associated with it, but not the superior vena cava. Okay? So now that we've talked about the right atrium, let's dissect it. I'm actually gonna use a scissor so I don't cut my fingers here. So right now I'm cutting into that, that flappy ear thing that I was talking about earlier, the right oracle. So I'm gonna make a cut into the right oracle on the superior border of that right oracle and I'm gonna extend it all the way over to our superior vena cava. I'm not gonna cut through the superior vena cava, okay? Now I'm gonna extend that cut down to the inferior vena cava. Okay, so now I'm extending it down. Jenny, do we have a better scissor than this one? Scissor? Yeah, this scissor's not very good at the grammar, but I don't wanna be super. Oh, 
All right. Get it opened up. And now I'm going to extend it over toward the midline here. And then I'll have a nice little flap and we can talk about more anatomy inside of the right atrium. So you can think of the right atrium as basically like a big collecting chamber. It collects all of the blood from the body. It's going to collect blood from the upper body through the superior vena cava and blood from the lower body through the inferior vena cava, if I can find it. There's our inferior vena cava right there. So it's all dumping into our right atrium right here. Uh, can you guys see that very well? If not, we will uh, compare it to our heart model where everything is going to be a lot more obvious. So when I open this thing, the most obvious part when I open it is going to be on the anterior wall. We've got these interesting muscles that are called pectinate muscles. They kind of look like feathers. And these muscles are going to be responsible for contracting the right atrium and allowing blood to keep flowing through the heart. Along this wall, we also notice that there is a structure right here. Does anybody know what this structure is? Let's see if we can point it out. Let's, well, first of all, let's see if it's even on our heart here so we can point it out. No, it's not actually. So let's just talk about it right now. So we've got this thing right here, which is Crista terminalis. It's basically the division between the pectinate muscles, which are really muscular looking muscles, and then basically the smooth wall of that right atrium. So if we look at the other wall right here, we see that it's totally smooth. And the crystal terminalis is what separates the muscular part from the smooth part of that wall. All right, what else can we find here in our atrium? I got one for you. So earlier we were talking about all of the blood pooling from the cardiac veins back here in the coronary sinus. If you look into the right atrium, you could see that there's a hole, or maybe you can't see because it's awfully dark. Jenny, can we get a light over here? All right, we're gonna try to get a light on it. If not, I'll point it out on your heart model. So there's an opening right here where all of that blood from the veins that are collecting the blood of the heart's muscles, they're gonna dump into that right atrium. If you look on your heart model, it's number 25 right in there. There's 25. So if you guys have your models with you, you should be following along, okay? So it's gonna be number 25. And that's where all the blood coming from the heart muscles are going to dump back into that right atrium. Another thing that we've got in that right atrium, which is not very obvious on this heart, we've got this little dimple right here. It's a little tiny impression right there. In a baby, that thing would be totally open. And that allows the blood from the mother to pass from the right atrium to the left atrium, which we'll open up in a second. And the reason why you want that is because you don't want blood being sent to the baby's lungs, right? The baby can't be breathing air because they're in the womb, obviously. So we don't want any blood going into the lungs. If it, if it winds up in the lungs and it stays in the lungs, it's gonna clot. It'll get stuck in there. So there's all sorts of things in the developing heart, in the heart of a baby, that end up getting closed in an adult. And that's because we want the oxygenated blood from the mother to kind of bypass things in the heart and bypass the lungs, for example, because otherwise they'll wind up there. They don't need to be doing anything because the baby can't be breathing air 
in the womb, and we don't want it to clot inside the, the lungs. So if we look at our, our divot here, right there, which is in the baby called the foramen ovale, the very first breath that you take as a baby closes it, or at least it should close it. And then when it closes, it's called fossa ovalis. So the name changes, because it's no longer a foramen, and a foramen is a hole. And you guys can see that it's kind of brown right here. It's number 24, right there, the brown thing. And that just closes off. Your very first breath that you take will close it. I was reading last night that in about 15 to 25% of people, it doesn't fully close. And it's not a problem because the size of the hole is going to be teeny tiny, maybe like the, uh, the tip of the, the probe here. So it's a teeny tiny little hole. It's slightly leaky, but it's not really a huge problem. It's slightly inefficient, but it's, it's not a problem. And a lot of us live with that condition and we never even notice it. Other people, though, the foramen fails to close and it stays open and it leads to major inefficiencies of the heart. The heart is not operating nearly as well as it should in somebody with a fully closed uh, hole. And in that case, you'd actually need surgery. And that can be you know, quite a major surgery for, for a child to have their heart operated on. All right. Does anybody have any questions about our right atrium before we move into the next chamber? No? All right. That must have been so exciting that nobody had a question. Fantastic. Okay. So moving from our right atrium, we go over something called the tricuspid valve. And it's called the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps. Whoever named it did a great job of describing exactly what it looks like, the tricuspid valve. So I got my finger right here poking through that tricuspid valve. I'm in a totally different chamber now. Does anybody know what that chamber I have my finger in is? I've stuck my finger through the right atrium and now I'm in a totally different chamber. What is that chamber called? You can see it right here on the heart. I see uh, Ashley. The right ventricle. Exactly, the right ventricle. So the difference between the right atrium and the right ventricle is basically going to be how strong of a pump it is, right? So the right atrium basically just receives blood from the body. It does have some muscles because we saw those chunky pectinate muscles earlier. It's got some muscles so it can contract, but I mean, if you think about it, how far does it have to pump the blood? From there to there, right? Not very far, so it doesn't have to be so powerful, okay? But now when we open up the right ventricle, we're gonna find out that it's way more muscular than the right atrium because it's gotta pump the blood further. So why don't we cut that open next? All right, so my very first cut is going to be just inferior to this structure right here. So we got this big vessel coming off right here. It is going to be number six on the heart model. Number six on the heart model right there. Does anybody know what that one's called? Maggie, go ahead. The pulmonary trunk. What was it? The pulmonary trunk. Yeah, pulmonary trunk. Fantastic, okay. So my first cut is going to be just inferior to the pulmonary trunk. So I'm gonna make a cut right there. Okay, wish me luck. Hopefully I don't cut my fingers. All right. So I just cut through there. Now I wanna extend my cuts inferiorly all right all 
All right, so I'm cutting inferiorly here. All right, so now I'm cutting through the wall of, let's see what it is. Can't even read that thing. Okay, I'm cutting through the wall of number five, okay? If you wanna follow on your, uh, your heart models, I'm cutting through the wall of number five, which is the right ventricle, okay? Now I'm gonna cut through the other wall of the right ventricle, number five on your heart model. And then we can take a look to see how things look differently on this side of the heart relative to the other side of the heart. So earlier when we were in the right atrium, we had you know kind of chunky muscles, these pectinate muscles, okay? It doesn't have to be that strong because it doesn't have to pump the blood very far. But now on the right ventricle, the walls are so much thicker. You can see how thick these walls are here. So incredibly thick relative to the right atrium. And you can also see the texture of the muscles here looks totally different, okay? They look really meaty. And uh, whoever the early anatomists were that named them, they, they recognized that they're really meaty. They call them trabeculae carniae, okay? Meaty, carniae. All right, so now let's find some structures in here. Earlier I said that Passing from the right atrium to the right ventricle, you're gonna pass over a valve, right? So you can see the valve right here. And there's gonna be three cusps on it. It's called the tricuspid valve. If you wanna follow along on your own heart, it's right there, number 26, right there, number 26. So you can kind of see that we got a valve here, got that opening, push through from the right atrium into the right ventricle right here, okay? Number 26. If you look inside of the right ventricle, you see the valve, and you see that the valve is anchored by what looks like cords. And the cords are connected to small muscles. These cords, they basically assure that when our right ventricle contracts, when it pumps, it doesn't push blood back into the right atrium. We don't want that. We want everything to head in one direction. So these things prevent against rebound of the valves. We want the valves to operate the same way every single time. We wanna assure that the blood is only heading in one direction through the heart. So these valves close when it's time for our ventricle to contract and pump the blood through the heart. They close. And because it's contracting and it's producing a ton of pressure, these cords, and these little muscles right here, they help ensure that our valve doesn't go the wrong way, that it stays closed, and that the blood keeps flowing in the same direction. What else do we have to talk about on this side? If you look at your heart right here, you see that there is a valve right there, okay? And that valve is going to be partitioning our right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk. Does anybody know what this valve is called right there? It is number 27. Olivia, go ahead. I saw your hand first. It's the pulmonary valve. Yeah. So... If you look in our right ventricle, it's got two valves, right? It's got that tricuspid valve, and then it's got more valves up through here, the pulmonary valve. These valves have to operate in a very specific way in order to ensure that the blood is getting into it 
that it can contract and it can send the blood through to the lungs, right? So these valves are really important for ensuring that the blood is flowing in the right direction and ensuring that we've got uh, parts of the valve blocked off or parts rather of the ventricle blocked off so we can increase the pressure when the ventricle contracts and push blood off into the lungs. So the entire time that we've been talking about the right atrium and the right ventricle, the blood's been deoxygenated, right? Because it was receiving deoxygenated blood from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Goes into the right atrium, which pumps it into the right ventricle, and it's deoxygenated. There's no oxygen left in it. And then it pumps it through the pulmonary trunk, okay? So we haven't actually talked about this. It's not really the heart, but it's related to the heart. Going from the pulmonary trunk, we're gonna travel through something called the pulmonary arteries. What do the pulmonary arteries go to? Kai, go ahead, I saw your hand first, Kai. It travels to the lungs. Exactly, it travels to the lungs where it picks up oxygen. And then it's gonna travel back to the heart. And it's gonna travel back to the heart on the back side of the heart. And we've got some pericardium stuck to it, so I'm gonna cut some of this stuff off and hopefully we can find those structures if they haven't already been cut off this heart when it was removed from the pig. All right, let's see if we can find them here. I think they kind of cut some of them out. Okay, here's some right here. You can see these small holes. That's where the blood is going to be returning. And let's find it on your heart model. So number 32, that's where the blood is going to be returning to the heart from the lungs. And it's kind of funny because the way that these things are named, uh, the veins and the arteries, basically it depends on whether it's going to or coming from the heart, okay? So if it's coming from the heart, then it's called an artery. And when we think of arteries, we think of them carrying oxygenated blood, right? And that's the funny thing because the pulmonary arteries are traveling away from the heart but these arteries are not carrying oxygenated blood which is really confusing number 32 our pulmonary veins they're carrying blood back to the heart that's been oxygenated so these veins are carrying oxygenated blood it's really confusing so that's something that doesn't really make sense if you're, you know, thinking of arteries carrying oxygenated blood and veins carrying deoxygenated blood. That can be really confusing. So number 32, that is our pulmonary vein, okay? Confusing. See, I was even confused talking about it. And that's going to be carrying the blood back to our left atrium which I'm gonna cut open right now. Let's see which number, what is our left atrium? Does that have a number associated with it? It does. Number 14, that's a left atrium, okay? So if you wanna follow on your heart, right now we're gonna be dissecting the left atrium, number 14. So here's what it looks like on our heart here. Again, we got that big weird ear flap the oracle, okay? So I'm gonna be making cuts into that now. All right, hopefully I don't cut my fingers. Wish me luck. So I'm gonna be cutting into the superior surface of number 14.
And right now I'm just making a big flap so we can open it up and take a look at what's inside. All right, look at these muscles. These muscles look feather-like. Do you guys remember seeing this in the right atrium? You also have it in the left atrium. Do you guys remember what I called these muscles right here? Started with a P. You can see it kind of here on your, your model. So right there, you can see it on your model, right there on the inside of two or the inside of 14. You guys remember what that was? Started with a P, they're feather-like muscles. Anybody, raise your hand. This is not on your heart model, so this is something that you'd have to remember. I got you on this one. They're called pectinate muscles. So we can actually – okay, Billy doesn't count because he's a medical student. Come on. <laughs> okay, so Billy, we know that you know it, okay? All right, so the pectinate muscles on the left atrium, they're the same that we find in the right atrium. And that kind of tells us that they're going to have similar functions and they're gonna basically have the same capacity for pumping, okay? They're gonna be little pumps. They don't need to pump very far. Remember that the right atrium only had to pump to the ventricle, not very far. Same thing with the left atrium. So we're on the kind of the, the back and left side of the heart here. These pectinate muscles, it doesn't have very far to pump. It's only got to pump like two inches or something like that, okay? These are basically just receiving tanks. What the heck is this? I think we got a blood clot in here. Something gross. Okay. Ew. All right. What else can I tell you about this side? What do we have on your model? Do they have anything in there? Nothing. Apparently it wasn't that big of a deal because they didn't put anything on the inside of the model. So we will just talk about what we can see here. So going into that atrium, I said that there was going to be some really big vessels delivering blood that has now been oxygenated into the left atrium. Do you guys remember what I called that one? The big vessels that are going to deliver oxygenated blood into the left atrium. You guys can look at your heart models if you need to. I see Janita. Go ahead. Pulmonary veins? Yeah, those were those weird vessels that have a name that we wouldn't expect, right? We always think about veins as carrying deoxygenated blood, but in this case, it's carrying oxygenated blood. Those pulmonary veins, I'm sticking my finger through one of the holes, they dump into the left atrium. That left atrium uses the pectinate muscles and it contracts, sending the blood down over a valve right here. So I'm not gonna tell you guys what this valve is called. I want you to tell me what the valve is called. The valve is separating the left atrium from the left ventricle down in there. Does anybody know what that's called? I saw Kai's hand first. Go ahead, Kai. It's called the bicuspid valve. Yeah, it's called the bicuspid valve. So if we look here on your heart model, it's number 29. Number 29. So how many cusps does the bicuspid valve have? Uh, let's go with Samira. 
What is it for? No, how many cusps does it have? Oh, two? Yeah. So that's super convenient that they name these things what they named them as. Some people call it the, the mitral valve, which is, I mean, I, I guess that describes the, the, the shape of it. The, the mitre is like the, the Pope's hat, uh, which has two sides to it. I don't like using that name because I don't think that it does a great job of uh, describing it. I think that the bicuspid valve, because it has two cusps, that's a better way to describe it. So the bicuspid valve is going to separate the right atrium, or excuse me, left atrium, sorry, left atrium from the left ventricle. Okay, so now let's cut open that left ventricle. Earlier we saw how muscular the right ventricle was, right? It's quite muscular because it has to pump to the blood, uh, it has to pump the blood to the lungs, which is, you know, a fair distance. All right, check it out. When I cut open the left ventricle, you'll see how much thicker the walls are. It's really, really muscular. And that makes sense because it has to pump blood to the entire body. So it has to be super, super strong, okay? So let's see what that's called on your heart before I dissect it here. I suppose it's number 15. Yeah. So right here, if you look at number 15, forms here this kind of like a triangular apex of the heart. That's what I'm going to be dissecting next. Number 15, the left ventricle. And I want you guys to pay special attention to how thick the walls are on that ventricle. They're extremely muscular, which makes total sense because it has to pump blood to the entire body. It has to be really strong. All right, so we've got a little cut in the heart here already. I didn't do that. I'm gonna to try to avoid that the best I can. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to make a cut. This is called the interventricular septum right here, which is just like a really fancy way of saying, it's a thing that separates the ventricles, okay? So this interventricular septum right here is the thing that, it's a big muscular wall that separates the right ventricle from our left ventricle. I'm gonna make my cut right alongside that. So there's gonna be, a number of blood vessels on there that I'm going to try to avoid cutting. So if you're looking at your heart model, you can see number 17. I'm going to be cutting just to the left along number 17 there, okay? And the walls are super, super thick on this structure. I'm moving the pressure out of the way. <laughs> All right. So you can see how thick that is, and I haven't even finished cutting it. You see how much thicker it is on this side? I mean, it's on the side on the right ventricle because it has to pump it to the lungs, but look at the left ventricle. I'm not even done cutting it. It's like five times as thick. All right, so basically I'm just going to try to cut it all open and then just fold it up. All right. All right, wow, look at that. Look how thick that is. That is incredibly muscular. Maybe this is a good example here, looking at that wall. Right ventricle, left ventricle. Geez, 
super duper thick. Inside that left ventricle, we have very similar things that we saw in the right ventricle, right? So we've got a valve that we call the bicuspid or mitral valve. You can see my finger passing through that space right here from the left atrium to the left ventricle right through here, passing right over that valve. That valve have two cusps, and those cusps of the valve, they're connected by these tendinous cords right here. If you can see the tendinous cords, let me point them out with a, a probe here. They're right there. There's our tendinous cords. The cords are connecting the valves, the cusps of the valves, to these big muscles right here. And that's to ensure that the valves don't blow back and lead to a, weaky, uh, to a leaky heart right there. Let's see if we can find what number it is on. No, we don't actually have any numbers associated with it. Hey, but no big deal. All right. So the next place that the blood's going to be flowing, I got to remove this blood clot right here. So this is a blood clot. This is not a big deal. This is just what happens when uh, blood congeals. So when the body dies and the blood's not pumping through there, some of it's going to pool in the heart, and it basically just hardens. So we're going to get rid of that. That's not a problem. That happens naturally. All right, so next, I might have to do a little bit more dissection here. I'll cut it open a little bit more, and we're going to talk about one more very important valve. See if we can find it. There we go. So, we look at the heart, and I try to fold it back into its normal position the best I can without it falling apart. We've got one more great big vessel that we haven't talked about yet. I've got my pinky through it right now. I'm going to tell you what it is on your heart model. It's this great big red one right here. It is number seven. Right there, you can see number seven, this great big red structure here, number seven. Okay? That's what I'm going to be sticking my pinky through, or my forefinger here, rather, sticking it through there right now. Does anybody know what this is? It's a really thick wall. Ashley, go ahead. The aorta. Yeah, that's the ascending aorta. The ascending aorta, if you can look at it, you see how thick the wall is? The wall is really, really thick. And that makes sense because the blood is going to be under incredible pressure. The really thick muscular walls of the left ventricle, they're going to contract, blub, 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 okay? And they're going to push the blood at high velocity and high pressure through the ascending aorta right here. So I got my finger running from the left ventricle up through the ascending aorta right here. High pressure, high velocity. It's got to send that blood to everywhere in your body, okay? So if you think about it, like your head, that's quite a ways from your heart, right? Or, or your hands, they're quite a ways away from your heart and you got to pump against gravity. So you're going to have to have really powerful contractions, and you're also going to have to have really thick walls on that aorta, otherwise it'll just pop. It'll be like a water balloon that you overfilled. It'll just pop. And we don't want that, because if your aorta ruptures, it's pretty much game over, quite quickly, too. So another important part about ensuring that the left ventricle can properly fill full of blood and then start its contraction to put the blood under incredible pressure before it moves it into that ascending aorta. It needs something to help it out. It needs some valves to help it out so it can compress the blood in there. So we're gonna have additional valves with the ascending aorta. Does anybody know what that valve is called? It's a very simple name for the valve. It's a good name for the valve. Olivia, go ahead. 
Uh, the aortic valve. Yeah, so it's the aortic valve, number 30 on your heart, right there. So valves are so important for the heart. They're gonna be really important for making sure that the blood is flowing in the right direction. It's really important for making sure that blood is being let into the different chambers of the heart at the right times. Uh, it's coordinated with the contractions of the heart. So the first thing that would be happening in this left ventricle is our mitral valve would open, blood would dump into the left ventricle, and it would pool inside of it. The mitral or bicuspid valve would close. The ventricle would start contracting, so it would squish itself closed. And then, after it's built up a ton of pressure in there, your aortic valve opens, the blood's under high pressure, high velocity, and it can flow to the entire body through that aorta. It's as easy as that. You guys have done the whole heart now. Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody want me to go over anything again? Does anybody want me to relate stuff that we saw in the heart dissection to your heart model? Is there any questions that I can answer for you? It can be about the heart, it can be about anything. It can be about science, it can be about uh, medical school, anatomy, anything that you want. Uh, yeah, Dr. Cossett, we, we are definitely getting some questions and I wanted to just have you um, maybe introduce yourself and go over your background and how you ended up as an anatomy instructor as they continue to think of questions and then we'll move on to their questions. Right on. So the reason why I didn't give myself an introduction earlier is because this is hard. All right, so I'm, <laughs> I'm Dr. Adam Cassette. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. Um, I'm Dr. Adam Cassette. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Basic Sciences. I teach anatomy and neuroanatomy, and now I'm going to be teaching a, uh, a class for a uh, master's of biomedical sciences. My journey to being an anatomist is uh, maybe more complex than you'd think. Uh, not only am I an anatomist, I'm also a vertebrate paleobiologist. Uh, that's just a mouthful for some guy who likes to uh, dig up fossils and describe new species. What I do is I look at fossil diversity of crocodilians for my research. I also look at turtles and dinosaurs and make connections between them to try to make sense of their biology, to make sense of mass extinctions, to make sense of animals, um, coping with environmental disruptions. So what I do is I apply my anatomy skills not only to humans, but I also apply them to reptiles and other fossil animals. It seems kind of strange for a lot of people to think like, well, if you study crocodiles, what does that have to do with the human? Well, a lot of things actually. Crocodiles have four chambered hearts. Crocodiles have all the same parts that we have. If you can understand a human, you can understand so many more animals because we all have similar histories. We all have similar evolutionary histories. We all share a similar common ancestor. So if I can understand a human heart, I can understand a crocodile heart. If I can understand a human skeleton, I can understand a turtle skeleton. We are all very similar. We've just been modified for whatever lifestyles it is that we've chosen to live over you know, millions of years. Another thing is paleobiologists or paleontologists, whatever you want to call us, we comprise approximately one third to one half of medical school anatomists. So this is very common. It's been something that's been done for hundreds of years. The earliest paleontologists were anatomists. The earliest anatomists were paleontologists. So this isn't something that uh, is necessarily new. But for a lot of people learning about it, uh, it's confusing at first and they can't make any sense of it. But uh, here I am, and it was a, a long journey, and I, I think it's going well so far. Does anybody have any questions about anatomy or, or my very confusing career choices? Yeah, I'm seeing two hands. Uh, Janita, why don't you go first? I saw your hand. Would you mind explaining the pathway of the heart again? Like, just repeating. Would you like me to go through all of the, like, the blood flow through the heart? Yes, sir, please. Okay. All right. So let's use your heart models. The heart models are gonna be nice and easy for you to follow along with, and it's not gonna be like falling apart in my hands. 
So I'm going to use the heart model right now to give you an explanation of how blood flows through the heart. And I'm also going to tell you about how it picks up oxygen and how it uh, gets rid of oxygen from the blood, okay? So if we look at the heart here, here's how it would sit in your chest, kind of at an angle, okay? Blood from the upper body is going to be coming in through the superior vena cava, number three. Blood from the lower body is gonna be coming through the inferior vena cava, number four. Well, the blood is gonna be deoxygenated coming through the superior and inferior vena cava. I'm gonna take the front side of your heart off, okay? Here we go, take it off, the front side. So, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava are going to be dumping into the right atrium. It's gonna be deoxygenated. You can think of the right atrium basically as a collecting chamber for deoxygenated blood from the upper and lower body. It picks up, all of that blood, it contracts, sending it over number 26, the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle. The right ventricle is big and muscular, and it's going to pump it over the pulmonary valve here into the pulmonary trunk. Remember, the blood is still deoxygenated. We need to send it to the lungs. So that's exactly what we do. We pump it through number 31 right here, which is going to be your ulnar arteries. Again, deoxygenated artery, it's very confusing. And then it goes to the lungs. The lungs are gonna be on the right and left side of the heart here. And that's where gas exchange is gonna happen, where the deoxygenated blood is going to pick up oxygen and now become oxygenated. Now it's time to send it back to the heart. If you look on the back side of the heart, number 32 right here, these are our pulmonary veins. Again, confusing because these veins are now carrying oxygenated blood. The oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins are going to be going into the left atrium. Okay? And it's oxygenated at this point, right? So it's gonna collect in here, and then it's gonna get a little squeeze pushing it over number 29, our bicuspid valve, into our left ventricle. Remember the left ventricle, super thick muscular walls, very strong pumping action. It's going to pump the blood up and over number 30, which is your aortic valve into the ascending aorta, and then the blood goes to the rest of the body, and it's oxygenated, and it can power you through your day and help you do the work that you need to do. Does Thank that work you. for you? Yep. Uh, I see, Kai, you have your hand raised. Feel free to ask your question. Um, do you think that the heart could ever pump backwards and for like somebody could actually uh, live with their heart pumping backwards? I mean, if, if the heart is slightly inefficient and there is some backflow, it's probably fine if there's limited backflow. If the backflow gets to be too intense, you wouldn't have enough oxygen flowing to the rest of your body and you could plan on basically the body shutting down and you need to do something at that point about it. Uh, the heart is not perfectly efficient in anybody. It will be slightly leaky in basically everybody. But the question is, how leaky is it? Slightly leaky is fine. Really leaky is bad. Does that make sense? I know it was kind of a vague yeah. answer, and I'm sorry about that. It's fine. I understand. Yep. As long as it's not too leaky, it's fine. Thank you, Kai. Uh, let's go to Ashley. I see your hand raised. Like, have you always known you wanted to be like an anatomist or like, did you decide you wanted like a med student and then decide I wanted to be an anatomist? Um, so I always wanted to be a vertebrate paleobiologist. And one of the things that they made us do when I was in graduate school getting a PhD, they made us take classes through the medical school. And I remember the first day that I was taking anatomy, I remember that I had to, uh, 
dissect. I was dissecting on the very first day, and I remember basically being being terrified of of having to make the first cut. And oh, hey, everybody! <laughs> I remember being terrified of making the first cut on the first day, and blood makes me squeamish. Uh, like violence and gore and things like that. Like I can't watch violent movies. I can't watch like horror movies or whatever. So I remember taking anatomy the first day and being like genuinely afraid of making my first cut. And there was a lot of apprehension. And when I started dissecting the body, the clarity that I gained in my own studies of reptiles, it was, it was immense because the human body is basically the same as a reptile's body. Uh, they've been slightly modified. Uh, but I just remember being super apprehensive the very first day. And then I started to love it. So I didn't plan on being an anatomist, uh, you know, 15 years ago or something like that. But when I finally took anatomy at the medical school, it was fascinating. The insights that you can get into a human body just by dissecting it, they're immense. They're great. Uh, and I fell in love. It basically took me... Uh, a couple hours to fall in, in love with anatomy, but the thought of dissecting a human being it produced apprehension in me. It was, it was a scary thought to dissect uh, a person, but I had to convince myself that these people wanted to be dissected. They donated their bodies for the purpose of being dissected. They donated their bodies for the purpose of educating uh, anatomists, for educating uh, medical students, future doctors. So if I could put that in my head, I didn't feel quite so bad about protecting uh, intensive and I fell in love with anatomy. It didn't take too long. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Kimberly, you next. Okay, I've got a question. These little holes on the side, like the little four holes on the side of 28, what do those do? Uh, I didn't hear that question. What was that? She, she asked the four holes on the side of 28, what do they do? Four holes on the side of 28, which is 28 here, first of all. Oh, the left atrium. Oh, okay. So the left atrium, remember when we were looking at the back here? We had our pulmonary veins. One, two, three, four. If you look inside the left atrium, those four holes correspond to the four different parts of the pulmonary veins. So that's what those four holes are inside of number 28, the left atrium. Does that make more sense for you? Yes, thank you. All right. Emma, I see you have your hand raised. Please feel free to ask your question. Um, how fast does everything happen in the heart? Like how fast does it pump it to the lungs and everything? Like velocities, things like that. It's going to depend on uh, the, the state of your body. So if your heart rate is really high, if you're out for a jog, for example, and your heart rate's high, then you can probably assume that your heart's going to be beating at a higher rate, okay? If your heart's beating at a higher rate, it's going to be going through the cycles faster. Whether or not the velocity is going to increase, uh, that's maybe debatable. Maybe the velocity increases, but the heart rate will increase, if that makes sense. So the cycles that the heart goes through, they're always going to be the same, uh, whether you're sitting down or running or whatever. Uh, it's just going to beat a lot faster because your body's going to be using more oxygen. It's going to be using more energy. You're going to need to pump the blood around the body uh, at a higher rate, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Yep. Dr. Cassette, do you mind if I add something there? Sure. Uh, so, guys, there's a uh, in medicine, we use a, a pretty simple formula for, for cardiac output um, where we take the stroke, what we call the stroke volume which is essentially how much it's clearing out of that left ventricle every time that muscular left ventricle squeezes. And so you take that stroke volume and you multiply it times the beats per minute, your heart rate, and then literally just those two numbers multiplied together, that gives you essentially what we call cardiac output. 
and that's the the amount of blood pumped through the heart in a minute, which I think in a healthy person is usually somewhere around five liters uh, per minute. If, so if you know how much a liter is, you can think about five of those going through your heart about every minute. Thank you. Thanks Thank for the teamwork on the physiology. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Kirsten, I see you have your hand raised. So when somebody has a hole in their heart, what exactly does that mean? Well, it could be a couple different things. Uh, a hole in the heart often could be like the patent foramen ovale right here. So if it doesn't quite seal off, that could be the hole in your heart. That's going to be very common. Like I said, maybe 15 or 25% of people have a very small uh, hole in there and it doesn't really affect them. They might probably would never notice it. Other people are going to have larger holes that are very obvious that are going to lead to inefficiencies of the heart and that's going to require some sort of intervention. Uh, so that's probably what they mean uh, with a hole in the heart. And if there is a hole there, if it hasn't completely sealed off when the baby takes its first breath, then you can expect blood, which is going to be deoxygenated on this side of the heart, to pass through into the left atrium here where blood should be oxygenated. So it could be leaky. It could be passing through uh, basically the wall in between the, the atria. So that's probably what, what is meant when you hear somebody having a hole in their heart. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions right now, so I will make sure to ask one. Oh, nope, Olivia, please go first. Go ahead and ask your question, Olivia. Um, what would happen if, the, if there was a hole in your heart and it got deoxygenated and it went into the oxygenated part of your body, like it went over in the left atrium? What would happen if like the oxygen and the deoxygenated mixed? Well, it'd be pretty inefficient. Uh, how about how about one of our medical school students? Can you guys uh, give us a physiological reason or otherwise why that would be a problem? Uh, yeah, if nobody minds, I'll I'll talk about this one again. Uh, so, a lot of the time when we talk about these these uh, these cardiac defects, holes in the heart, etc., a lot of the time those are present from birth. So you have to imagine that you have a a very tiny body that doesn't necessarily have as large of an oxygen demand as, a, as an adult um, who can, who both survives and adapts to this lower oxygen uh, environment that they have in their body because they're having this mixture of, of uh, deoxygenated and oxygenated blood. So when you make rounds in the, in the PICU or in the neonatal ICU and you see some of these kids with these, with these cardiac defects, some of them will be what we call blue babies. There are certain, there are certain conditions where these kids are just, they just have an oxygen saturation of about 70 to 80%. And that's just where they live. Now, most of these kids are slated for surgery in their, in their very young years, multiple surgeries, most of the time. Sometimes these kids have to be, uh, you know, given uh, additional therapies. They have to be on ventilators or they have to be put on temporary bypass, things like that to support them. But sometimes these kids grow up being essentially what we call hypoxemic just all the time um, because like you said you have what, what does that mean what does that mean hypo hypoxemic low low oxygen uh, low oxygen uh, dissolved in the blood so uh, you have we, we measure two things in the blood uh, in terms of oxygenation but essentially what it means is hypoxemia is that you don't have enough oxygen getting where it needs to go um, so uh, so yeah what like what you said what happens if that mixes the deoxygenated to the oxygenated? You're going to have kids who just have more deoxygenated blood circulating around, and they won't have as much um, as much of a tolerance for activity necessarily as some of their peers until they get that fixed. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Alex, right. uh, Alex, you have your hand raised. Yes, sir. Could you explain what happens in the heart during mitral valve prolapse? So if you've got those cords, this is clinical stuff again. So if somebody who understands this better than I do, please let me know. So if you've got your valves here. Let's turn the camera. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Sorry. So if you've got your valves here, 
these valves are supposed to be unidirectional, right? They're supposed to just open and close. They're supposed to stay in position. If you have maybe your cords here stretch or break, your valve can actually pop back up into the atrium, okay? So I think that's what's meant by a prolapse of the valve. And that would lead to a leaky heart, an inefficient heart. Can anybody else add on to that? And remember, I'm not a clinician. <laughs> yes, I'm doctor questions. I'm not a doctor. Well, I think that the probably the reason that mitral valve prolapse this I don't I've not read any research on this, but this is just me thinking out loud. Uh, you know, the mitral valve separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. The left ventricle is responsible for pumping blood throughout the body. So if that valve in particular is messed up as opposed to the tricuspid valve, you get that mixing of deoxygenated and oxygenated blood but like we've been talking about. And then, you know, you're sending out more deoxygenated blood to the rest of the body. Uh, so that, that seems to me why that would tend to be more severe than, you know, an issue you might have with the tricuspid valve because the blood's having to go much further. And remember, if you look at the heart, that left ventricle is extremely muscular. It's going to put the blood under incredibly high pressure relative to the right ventricle, which is going to be pushing it, you know, not as far. It's only got to push it to the lungs. So presumably the blood would be under a lower pressure condition relative to the left ventricle. So I agree with Logan that you're bicuspid valve is probably more likely to prolapse than your tricuspid valve as a result of the muscular walls and the basically ability to put the blood under high pressures. Um, I see that Katie is looking, Katie Owings looking, looks like she wants to ask a question in the chat. Katie, if you want to just unmute your mic and go ahead and ask, that would be fantastic. Let me see, Katie. Okay. There you go, Katie. I have a question. Like, if one side of the heart is pumping right, but the other one is. How does um? How does that happen? Katie, can you ask your question one more time? We lost you at the very beginning. Uh, I think I caught it. She said, if one side of the heart is pumping right and the other isn't, how does that happen and what, what happens with that? Is that right, Katie? Yeah. So this is going to be an issue of conduction, and I don't have a good answer for you. That would be more of like uh, Dr. Raj Kapalan, who's our heart physiologist. He would have a better answer for that. I'm, I'm not sure. That sounds like a conduction issue for me. So the heart is going to receive electrical impulses, right? And those electrical impulses have to travel through the heart in a very specific, basically a specific way in order for all the heart to work properly, for it to contract in the right order. Uh, how, how that conduction system goes bad, that's, that's beyond my knowledge. Okay, great. Maggie, uh, go ahead and uh, ask your question. model in the left ventricle there are these two peaks at the bottom near the um bicuspid valve that almost reach up the valve on our model and what's their purpose i couldn't hear that very well i'm not i'm not i heard something about the heart model but i'm not certain what the the question was on the model by the bicuspid valve, there are two peaks um, and what are the, that reach almost all the way to the valve. What are those and what is their purpose? Right. So these are the septal muscles that I was talking about before. So if you look at, you can see it here on your heart model right there underneath 29, which is your bicuspid or mitral valve. So you can see that there are two of these uh, papillary muscles. These papillary muscles, you've got two of them because you've got two cusps, right? on that valve, 
it's going to be connecting uh, to the cusps by these cords, right? So you have these tendinous cords. So here are the tendinous cords connecting the bicuspid valve to these papillary muscles, okay? These papillary muscles are going to be responsible for basically ensuring that uh, these things don't prolapse. They're going to help it out and make sure that they don't prolapse. You guys see that? Here's the papillary muscles, which are those bumps that we saw here earlier. Right there is our papillary muscles connecting to the valve by some cords. And that's going to ensure that this thing doesn't go the wrong way, that it opens unidirectionally, ensuring that the blood's only going to be flowing in rather than out. Thank you so much, Dr. Cossett. Um, anyone else have any questions for Dr. Cossett or anything like that? I'll, I'll ask my question. Um, you know, Adam, you've been doing this for a while. Would you say that you have a favorite thing to dissect or something that is either a little bit more interesting than the heart or maybe even something that's a little bit more difficult for the medical students that you work with to dissect? Um, and then just as a heads up to all the medical students, feel free to share when you go on to your breakout sessions after this, you know, think about what you really enjoyed when you were dissecting and what was maybe a little bit more difficult. That might be a good entry point to start some conversation with your campers. I think the most difficult thing to dissect, the, the guts. The guts are always gonna be moving around. They never seem to be staying in the same place. And that can be really difficult for people to learn because the orientation is difficult for them. One of my favorite things to dissect is the pharynx. Uh, so the pharynx, Basically, you could think of it as, as, as your throat, essentially. Uh, that's also a really difficult dissection because you have to disconnect the head and flip it forward. But it's super cool because it opens up all of these really deep structures and it keeps them in their anatomical orientation. It doesn't, uh, n nothing really gets mixed up during the dissection. That's super cool to see how all of those things work. And the approach that we use is... Uh, not the approach that you would expect to be using. You'd think that you'd go at it from an anterior perspective, but you end up just destroying all the anterior structures if you go at it from, from the front. So what we do is we fold over the head and you can see all of the tiny little muscles connecting the skull to the hyoid and things like that. It's a very cool dissection. It's also a very difficult dissection. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, that's what I would say. Of course, your favorite is like the most meticulous dissection that we had for the entire course. <laughs> It's, that's why he's in this job. I love it. Yeah. Um, Dr. Cossett, one, one other comment I'll have you touch on if you don't mind. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about the specifics of our anatomy lab. I know a lot of our students might be concerned about the smell and, you know, um, just what, what are the things that we bring in our anatomy lab that kind of make it great? And, you know, the fact that we're not in a deep, dark basement with, uh, with right. no natural light, things like that. That would right. be great. So when I took anatomy, I took it at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine, and that is like a pretty dank uh, anatomy lab. It was designed in like the 1960s. Ours was designed like five years ago. It's really bright in here compared to most anatomy labs. Uh, I'd like it to be a little bit brighter. Our airflow is really good, so it doesn't actually smell that bad in here. And we have the opportunity, the, the ability rather, to cool it down in here, which is going to kill some of that smell. So the airflow mixed with the ability to lower the temperature in here, uh, it preserves the bodies better and it doesn't actually smell that bad. We also have some really cool technologies in here. Uh, we have the ability to stream dissections via this camera here and by some cameras on the ceiling. We have a lot of really big TVs around here. We have iPads. Uh, so as far as our lab goes, we have more technologies than any anatomy lab I've ever been in. If you are confused about what you're looking at, we've got iPads in here and you can compare it to dissectors and things like that. Um, I would like us to work on our comparative collection. I'd like to have a pathological collection here. That's uh, a big strength that we had uh, at my, um, when, when I went and did anatomy at Iowa, we had a, path, a pathology uh, collection. So if we would find something, uh, out of the ordinary in one of the bodies, we would um, contact the, the family ahead of time, I guess, and have them sign waivers just in case we did find something interesting. And we would keep those things because they're wonderful opportunities 
to teach future medical students. So that's something that I would really like us to uh, work on in the future. But what is my favorite here are the technologies that we have. Uh, we can do all sorts of things here in this room that other medical schools can't do. Uh, we have a new technology called Sectra, which is a really cool opportunity for us to uh, help make connections between the radiology. So most, uh, most doctors are going to be interacting with the anatomy of their patients, not through dissection, okay? You, it's pretty rare that you end up cutting open a patient to figure out what's wrong with them. Use medical imaging technologies, uh, MRI, CT, X-ray, things like that. And we ended up getting a new machine called Sectra. You could think of it as like a giant iPad. You could think of it as like an iPad that's like uh, 70 inches across. And that's going to allow us to do some really cool comparisons between the medical imaging and what we see in our bodies. We can actually uh, order up medical images ahead of time for the donors that we get. So the bodies that we're actually dissecting, we could have them imaged if we should choose to do so ahead of time. And this machine that we have called Sectra can allow us to make comparisons between the medical images and the actual dissections that we're doing. So. My favorite part about the anatomy lab, it's brand new, it's really nice, and we have amazing technologies, and we also have amazing staff. We've got uh, Jenny, she's, she's our dream team here. Where is she? She's over here somewhere. There's Jenny. Yeah, so we have a really good team. Yes, I really appreciate your team as well. You guys have been very helpful with doing things in the past, and um, I look forward, once we get past the pandemic, of continuing to work with you guys, and. Uh, educate the people in this area about the human body. It's fantastic. Uh, we did have another question. Um, okay. Uh, the Haley says, I'm taking anatomy and physiology this year. What would y'all say was the hardest thing to learn about in that class? Um, and maybe Adam, we can just get your answer and then uh, all the counselors can go talk about that in their breakout session as well. I would say neuroscience, uh, the brain is, is extremely difficult. Uh, the way that we teach the brain here, I think is way more accessible than the way that the brain was taught to me. Uh, when I took neuroscience at the Carver College of Medicine, it was, it was way, way more difficult than anatomy. Uh, I think that we provide uh, something that's more accessible to the students. We, we train physicians here. Uh, they were training physicians there, but uh, they were teaching it like everybody was going to be a neuroanatomist. So uh, I would say the brain is definitely the hardest thing to learn, but the way that we approach uh, teaching the brain is, is much more accessible than uh, what I had when I was taking it. Awesome. I appreciate that. Well, okay. On that note, I want to say thank you to Dr. Cossett and, and Miss Jenny Brown for helping us out today and getting the heart models for us, uh, getting the hearts for us to dissect. And I hope everyone enjoyed following along.